We will begin this session by acknowledging that we are meeting on an Indigenous land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. I would like to acknowledge that living in Ottawa Gatineau, I am on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I would also like to recognize that we all work in different locations and therefore you're probably working on different Indigenous lands. And so I encourage you to take a moment to think about on which territory you are on today. Thank you. In this session, you'll learn about the importance of IP asset management, including building an IP strategy, IP searches, and IP valuation. IP Talks is the first collaboration of our recently launched IP Village initiative, which is helping teach our clients how to navigate and use the IP ecosystem, and which includes organizations that help build Canadian businesses. Our core partners are the Business Development Bank of Canada, the Global Affairs Canadian Trade Commissioner Services, Export Development Canada, the National Research Council's Industrial Research Assistance Program, the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada, the Department of Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, and of course, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. We know that it takes many people's help to build a successful business, and we're here to help you every single step of the way. So today's webinar is co-hosted by CIPO, NRC IRAP, IPIC, and BDC, and I am so thrilled to introduce today's speaker panel. First, we have Dr. Cynthia Shipman, who is an industry techn technical advisor in ITA with the National Research Council's Industrial Research Assistance Program, or NRC IRAP. IRAP works with SMEs to support growth through innovation. Cynthia brings to her role as an ITA more than 20 years experience in research, technology transfer, commercialization, and intellectual property protection of SMEs. She has developed and managed IP in a variety of industries, both in private practice and in-house. Her academic and professional experience as a PhD, an MBA, and a patent agent provides her with a broad technical background, and she works with IROC clients across the country in all technical areas on IP related matters. In addition to her own client portfolio, in addition to her own in client portfolio. Next, we have Dr. Beatrice Negacha, who is a partner with the firm Laberry in Montreal. She is a lawyer and a patent agent and practices mainly in the pharmaceutical, life sciences, and chemical engineering fields. In particular, Beatrice helps startups, SMEs, and large companies in obtaining and leveraging IP rights and supports, and supports them in their commercial growth and business success. And finally, we have Maximilian Yam. Max is an associate with BDC's Capital's Intellectual Property Backed Financing Team and joined BDC in 2020. Prior to joining BDC, he was an intellectual property analyst with Quantius, a commercial lender where he developed a patent analysis and valuation framework for new loans. Previously, he was a research assistant at WLAN, where he conducted patent portfolio valuations and market research during due diligence, portfolio acquisition, and licensing. So very warm welcome to all of our speakers and an extended thank you from SIPO for offering your expertise to our audience. So a little bit about myself, I am Nina Kushwaha and I'm the director of SIPO's IP Awareness and Education Services. I am a scientist by training and I've been involved in the IP space for over 15 years. I have a keen interest in helping Canadians and their businesses understand how IP assets can allow them to gain a competitive advantage to drive growth. This all starts with awareness and education. In this webinar, I will speak about the strategic approaches to using your IP, and then I will hand over the presentation to our speaker panel, who will talk to you about how all this works in practice.
So let's start with some common ways that businesses can take an idea to market and where IP can be leveraged in each of these models. Many entrepreneurs do everything themselves. They may work with IP professionals to protect their IP from others, but the main part of making and selling their product or service is something they manage alone. Protecting your IP is also the gateway into other models where you'll need to share it with others. So for example, through partner, partnering or uh, collaboration. IP is also the basis for letting someone else do all or some of the work through licensing agreements, including franchising. And finally, a way to monetize your IP is through selling it to someone else. So taking an idea to market often includes doing additional research and development and then considering one or combinations of these models. And it can also include doing business abroad. SIPO and our IP Village partners have the tools and resources, many of which will be presented today, and can offer valuable um, help at all these stages to effectively manage your IP assets. We know that SMEs that are aware of or hold formal IP are more likely to be innovative than SMEs that don't. However, simply being aware of or holding formal IP does not mean that you are managing your IP assets effectively. A critical element lies in building and implementing an IP strategy. So what is an IP strategy? An IP strategy comprises plans and actions designed to maximize the value of IP in order to achieve your business objectives. This strategy will be most effective if it's carefully aligned with your business goals. This could help you gain a competitive um, edge in the marketplace and drive sustainable growth. So we propose a six step approach to follow when building your IP strategy. We have a number of online tools that can help you with developing such a framework, but just briefly, I'll go through some of these steps. So first there's an internal audit, audit. So this is to identify your IP. There's an external audit, so that's to learn about the IP that's around you. Next, an analysis to identify IP gaps, creating an IP plan and how to use it. The implementation phase to put the IP plan into action and then a reassessment and um, realignment phase. So making sure you keep an eye on the IP around you and readjust your plan accordingly. So Dr. Shipman will be pro uh, providing practical examples of these concepts. And so I'll go through these steps just very, very briefly. As I mentioned in our first IP talks, much of the world's economy has shifted from an industrial economy to an idea economy. So this means that um, much of the economy is based on intangible rather than tangible assets. In fact, based on many different types of studies, over 90% of some companies' market value can come from intangible assets such as patents, strong brands, popular designs, and well-kept secrets. So to be part of this economy, you're gonna to need to know um, what your IP is. This can be a very enlightening step because many uh, businesses discover that uh, they actually own IP, but they never realized it. In fact, relatively few companies hold formal IP and only a fraction of these have a strategy for how to best use it. Interestingly, those that have formal IP are the ones that experience higher growth, are more likely to export, export and to seek financing. So the first step uh, towards your IP strategy is to identify your own IP through something we call an internal IP audit. If it's the first time you're assessing your own IP, I strongly recommend that you take a look at our IP inventory checklist located in our IP toolbox. This is a free tool to help you start identifying your IP assets. It contains a list with intangible assets your business may have and which IP rights are most suited to protect them. So just a note, this is one of our most downloaded resources and a great starting point. So yes, it's one thing to dream about your idea, but remember that the IP landscape is very real. Dr. Nagacha will be speaking to us the importance and limitations of IP searching, especially when, to try, especially when you're trying to learn about the IP around you. So IP rights are legal rights. So knowing who your competitors are and what they do is an important part of your business intelligence. 
It contributes to building your IP landscape, which informs your decision making and reduces the risk of being sued for infringement. It also gives you an idea of what your competitors think is important and what they are trying to achieve. It can provide information on registered IP rights and those which are about to or have expired. And they also provide opportunities to find IP that you could buy or license from others. Another important uh, note is to um, make sure you stay on target. So based on your IP inventory and the findings from the IP landscape exercise, you may find gaps that prevent you from achieving your business objectives and opportunities that could help you achieve them. So to structure your thinking and find the gaps, start by thinking about your business goals and what IP you have. So for example, IP is a territorial right and therefore only protected in the countries or regions where they are registered. You may wish to strategically file for new IP rights, especially if you're looking to expand into international markets. Also, think about your core business and what makes you unique. Why do customers choose your product or service? How are you different from your competition? And is the IP protecting these key differenti differentiators? Another related uh, area in IP gap analysis is standards. So products and services are often subject to a range of regulations and standards to ensure products are safe um, and that performance can be measured, compared, integrated, and so on. Sometimes a dominant technology is protected by a patent, which you may need to license if you want your invention to be part of a bigger system. Identifying the relevant standards is part of the gap analysis, so you can determine what to do next. And finally, remember that many of these goals are relative to time. So in your analysis, short, medium, and long-term IP gaps should be identified. Let's, take, let's talk a little bit more about some of the factors that can determine how you plan to use your IP in your business. So for example, some companies have a business goal to reach market leadership. They file for and enforce their IP rights to block uh, competitor growth. This is called an offensive strategy and usually involves a large IP portfolio and a legal budget to maintain and enforce the rights. Other companies may take a more defensive approach where their aim is to avoid to get, getting into legal disputes by um, minimizing the risk of infringing um, on anyone else's IP rights. Here, the IP options will range from inventing around um, a competitor's patent or obtaining IP rights through licensing. In this case, the emphasis would be on the quality of the IP as opposed to the quantity. Some monetize IP mostly through licensing to others. Uh, so for example, a company could make sure that the invention is protected in all key markets and then use combination of different types of IP to license an invention for different applications or regions. Remember that um, intangible assets such as IP can represent over 90% of a company's value. So IP can also be an important tool to raise capital. Leveraging IP assets through a financially driven strategy may increase financial benefits for your company in the event of a merger and acquisition or initial public offering. So now once you've decided on a plan that suits your needs and goals, a very important tool in implementing your IP strategy is the use of contracts. So let's go over some contracts that you need to be familiar with and, and how to use them. So an assignment agreement is a contract that transfers the rights of the IP from one creator to another entity, such as a company. So if you're hiring contractors to develop or create software, movies, domain names, research, um, just make sure that they have, um, they've signed these types of agreements to assign um, IP to the company. Simply put, this contract is there to ensure that the company owns the intellectual property and not the employees. Another type of contract is a non-disclosure agreement, also known as confidentiality agreements, which are legally binding contracts that allow parties to divulge confidential information with one another under a binding agreement so that neither party can disclose uh, or otherwise misuse that confidential information. 
NDAs are used in almost all aspects of business transactions, but are particularly important when dealing with IP, especially if it hasn't been formally protected. So for example, if it's still in the form of a trade secret. While you are still improving your invention, it may be impractical to acquire uh, formal IP protection. So confidentiality agreements may be the only effective way to um, protect that IP at that time. And just remember that NDAs must be signed before disclosing any confidential information. So we had talked about um, IP management best practices in our, our first session. Um, and just to reiterate it, 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 it is key because we do know that um, disorganized IP management can lead to theft, IP theft, loss of reputation and income and decrease a, a, a company's value. So again, here are a handful of ways that a, that a company can um, better safeguard their IP. So they can create policies that document the default position on IP ownership, um, they can sort out how to report internal IP disclosures. They can ensure to know how to talk about IP, uh, make a habit of searching IP to keep abreast of the landscape around you, and control their IP ownership in writing in the form of contracts. Now, even the most perfectly thought out strategy can be affected by unforeseen factors, uh, which could require your IP strategy to change. Many businesses have an invention, they apply for a patent uh, with an idea of where to file, and then they head back to business as usual. This is what some IP professionals refer to as file and forget, and can result in an irre irreversible path for your business. These days, the rate of uh, invention and technology adoption are changing so fast. So your IP strategy will need to uh, have sort of a constant fine tuning. It's like a living plan and it reflects how you will protect um, and use your ideas uh, to adapt to the changing IP landscape around you. So again, make sure you always have an IP strategy that's relevant to your business goals. And your business goals may evolve over time. So strategic partnerships or unexpected product or service changes may happen. And this can bring extra IP assets into the portfolio that will need to be managed. Assets can become expensive to maintain. Um, so the cost of maintaining IP assets should also be weighed against the business value. You should plan for regular review and reprioritization of incoming and active IP assets. The frequency for review varies for different businesses and their IP portfolio sizes. So for example, um, global business reviews um, their IP um, annually, quarterly, and sometimes even monthly. So here's another tool I'd like to point out too. Um, you've seen that the IP strategy is a multifaceted uh, plan requiring business, technology, market, and legal expertise. And SIBO has this resource to help you uh, create a guide that's tailored to your specific needs. It's called the IP Strategy Assessment Tool, and it applies these considerations amongst others. It's a very well used tool on our site, and again, a great start in developing your IP strategy. So uh, we've gone through a few steps to consider when building your IP strategy uh, that aligns with your business goals, including identifying the IP that you have, the IP that others have, identifying um, gaps, creating a plan, putting that plan into action and monitoring and readjusting accordingly. Now let's see how some of these concepts are put into practice. Our first um, speaker is uh, Dr. Cynthia Shipman. So Cynthia, you'll be speaking to us about using IP as a business tool. What are some of the key questions that arise during discussions with your IRAP clients? Thanks very much, Nina. Um, the key questions, it's, it's highly variable because every IRAP client is unique. That, that's the nature of it. And that also speaks to why they're gonna have IP. Um, that unique feature could be the knowledge of their customer base, it could be unique technical information, it might be their experience or their network. Um, so it, there, there isn't any given typical IRAP client. One thing to keep in mind is IRAP 
the relationship is, is effectively one-to-one -one with the company. And so ITAs deal with their company sort of on their own tailored plan and bringing their own experience to the table as well. So there isn't really a typical question, but what I would say we do start with, oh, there's my introduction for IP and practice. The place to start the dialogue tends to be, what do you have and where do you want to go? Um, this is really open-ended and loose, and it's kind of intended that way because we can all handle yes, no answers. You flip a coin, worst case scenario, but it could depend on your technology, your relationships. You might be in a partnership with somebody else. They've got their own IP, you do too. What's that gonna look like? What are you gonna do when you get together and build a bigger thing? What are your resources? Uh, as Nina mentioned, this can get expensive. Nobody, as far as I know, has an infinite amount of money to put towards IP strategy or any other aspect of their life. And the file and forget is real. Um, I sometimes refer to it as random acts of IP. File the trademark agent on day two of or trademark application on day two of incorporation, and then never really do anything with it. Um, so, so if why ask yourself why you would be making these decisions and make informed choices, and then where do you want to go? How will the business grow? Are you building something brand new? Are you adapting product A to fit into market B? Uh, do you already know that you've got the technology? You now you have to validate it. It's highly variable and software doesn't have the same needs that drug development do. We live in a global community. Uh, where do you want to go? There's 200 sovereign nations on earth. How are you going to choose? And there's many, many different ways to do this. They're all right. Uh, some of them might be more applicable than others. There's multiple types of IP. I, I refer to these as flavors, so to speak. Um, just like an ice cream cone, you stack up several scoops, you can have multiple flavors in one ice cream cone. Um, but if you handle it wrong, you're going to break it. Your ice cream's going to fall over and hit the floor. Make a great big mess and then there'll be tears. Uh, this can be costly to fix, or you could lose it entirely. If you are actively engaging in sales and disclosures and show and tell of your technology, and you haven't taken appropriate steps to protect the, core, the IP, so not everything is going to be proprietary and secret, but you need to know what is, and then you can take the appropriate action. Um, Often you can speak to the problem you're solving as opposed to your technology. People will pay money for solving their pain and their problems. Um, the technology might be primary to your considerations, but it may be secondary to the person with the problem who is ultimately the customer. Looking the wrong thing to advance my slides. My apologies for that. So as Nina mentioned, ownership matters. Uh, you want to make sure you as a company, your, your, your own legal entity, that you can actually act. Does the company own the IP or have all the employees not assigned something yet? Or is there a contractor who you know, the correct words were omitted from the contract and now the company doesn't own what they thought they did? You want to know what agreements you have. These are things that have been signed. These include your NDAs, your assignments, even employment contracts. Those, those carry weight. Different types of IP need different kinds of ownership transfer. It's not uh, a blanket, one thing, one fit, one size fits all. Uh, you want to know what jurisdiction your rights continue into. So, different countries, everybody's a little different uh, in terms of formal IP rights, patents, and trademarks, and things like that. Uh, the United States and Canada are completely separate entities. Having a Canadian trademark doesn't necessarily carry the weight you want it to in the United States or elsewhere. Where are you going to do business? Where are you going to sell? It's going to be cost prohibitive to do every IP right in every country. You can't do that. Um, the BC, not Quebec reference, there's 10 provinces and, and three territories in Canada, and they all have their own provincial uh, legal considerations as well. So there's not one uniform set of rules across the country. They're all trying to do the same thing, but there's subtle differences. And this speaks to the need for ensuring you engage uh, the relevant expertise. Uh, again, IP inventory, you still need to know what you have. And this goes back to that first question is what do you have? Zipo tool, I send it around to a lot of clients. Uh, I find it really great to open the dialogue and get people thinking about different ways they might have IP. Most of the time in high tech, you're thinking of my technology, you're thinking hard on patents or uh, software and code, but there's a lot more than that. When you get together with other people to buy, sell, co-develop, trade, whatever's involved, you're gonna see words 
foreground IP, background IP, jointly developed, jointly owned, all these different words. What do they mean? And how does that impact what you want to do? It's wonderful to jointly own everything and share, but the reality is some pies don't slice very well. Uh, you need to consider how it's going to work and who's going to commercialize the technology. A shared resource that neither party can really work with doesn't benefit anybody. So you need to plan this and, and know what to expect as it goes forward. Um, inventory, you want to take action to secure it. Again, it's one thing to identify it. Do you own it? How could somebody else disrupt your ownership position? Um, are you working with a university, for example, or you have summer students coming in the door? Did you have a competitor having a meeting in your boardroom and you forgot to clean your whiteboard? That kind of idea. And cybersecurity, um, this matters. It's, it's very disruptive to businesses. Sometimes active theft can occur. Other times it's just locking you out. But trade secrets are um, kept usually on computers behind passwords. You're going to have to log into systems. You're going to have pass cards on your doors. That all connects to cybersecurity. IP does not exist in an independent silo sort of off to the side. It, uh, it integrates and knits together all the different areas of your business. And you still need to keep an eye on what third parties are doing because you're never alone. Your technology might be a beautiful complement to somebody else's to expand the market amazingly if you got together with them. Or maybe they have the same great idea you do and you're both chasing the same problem solution, but you're going to come at it from different routes. Could be. And I think the important thing to, re to recognize is that you aren't alone and you don't exist in a vacuum, as I've said, and everybody will get to the same place eventually if they're interested in doing that. So you might take the black arrow here and go in a straight line path through your own IP that you control as well as publicly available knowledge, whereas your competitor is going to follow a red line path. They can't work with your proprietary materials. They have to go around it, but eventually they will get there. And what are you going to do? So you're continually reinventing yourself. This is research and development. This is strategy. Freedom to operate will come up. Um, I prefer to suggest that people think of it as a path to freedom to operate as opposed to a binary answer because it will change with time. The information you have today is not going to be the information you have two years from now. The market you're selling in today is not the market you're selling in two years from now. Your technology might even be different. So the freedom to operate you've addressed today for the market you're in today, for the product you have today, might change. And you want to be aware that this may change and plan for that. Knowing what others have is also a form of competitive intelligence. When you know who's in the space, they may be competitors of collaborators. How do they get there? What rights do they own? And when you start finding this information, and patent searches and trademark searches can be very good ways of doing this because they send signals. If a firm is investing a lot of effort in filing patents and trademarks, they're sending a message that this is economically important to them. Now, is it defensive or offensive? That's a different question, but it's important to them economically. Um, if you're searching and you're finding a bunch of dead art that things are abandoned, old papers, old research, this isn't particularly new, that's sending another signal and you have to ask what happened. And Beatrice will speak a bit more about searching and how to do it uh, next. But you want to ask what happened because again, markets change, trends come and go. Uh, if you look at COVID technology right now, it's all over the map. Two years ago, there was none. And five years from now, it's not going to be the focus anymore. So you have to look at what's influencing these changes. And so if you do find third party art, what do you do about it? Um, it depends on what it is and what it says. It could be just valuable context information or it could represent a pothole in the road. And we know from driving our truck down the highway at 100 miles an hour, if you hit that pothole without braking, you're going to break your axle and the whole thing's going to come off the rails. But if you can slow down a bit and go around it, you might be okay. You may not get there as fast, but you're not going to destroy the truck entirely. If you do find it and you do see that you need it, and this could be something from a standards um, essential patent, like um, uh, for video codex or something along those lines. There's a variety of different standards and in inter industries. Uh, licenses are not automatic. Sometimes they can be very easy to get. They can almost be a click wrap exercise, but they're not automatic. You have to go and get one. And 
wishing to have one isn't going to just get it. And when you're talking to IRAP, we are investing in the growth of your firm, not the other companies. Our questions that we will ask you once you've said what you've got and where do you want to go is how will this make money? How will this translate into economic growth, job creation, and that kind of thing? So those are the big things to keep in mind at the end of the day. IP without a commercial plan is an interesting collection and it can be art on the wall and it can be expensive art. It needs to work for itself. So if you are working with somebody else or you do discover other rights, uh, how do you need to handle this? Uh, if your technology is a bicycle, they have a wheel, each one of you has to find some way to work together because a bicycle is useless without wheels, but a wheel without a vehicle is kind of interesting from a physics perspective and that's about as far as it goes. If you're on this bicycle, it's going to go fast. You may both need to find a way to make this thing stop so you don't hit the wall. And then where do you go from there? Who's Who's doing what? Who needs what? How do you divide up your market and your pie? Um, all or nothing is actually quite rare. You could divide it many different ways, by country, by use, by a technical field, a mountain bike versus a road bike. They're both bicycles, but they have very different components. Um, different IP rights may be not shared, others may be shared. If you're gonna sell in different countries, your distributors may need specific access to use your trademarks or your brands, but they might not need to know your trade secrets. So you wanna think about what is the future plan that uh, they and you will do with your IP. And again, to reiterate IP strategy, this is not one and done. It's like a garden and you have to care for it. It will change over time. It works across all the verticals of your company, not an isolated tower on the edge of the plate. And your growth of your company will depend on not only securing your IP in any one of many ways, including patents, trademarks, maintaining secrecy, but also how to exploit it. How do you leverage it? And if you focus on, think about making a bigger pie rather than worry about how big your slice is, um, you're in a growth mindset and that's a good thing. You still have to protect your own turf, but how do you expand the value and the reach of them? And that, that's the real tricky part to go from just developing science and technology to having a growth-minded firm. And how will you make money? How will it pay for itself at the end of the day? Will you license? Will you sell? Are you selling direct products? Are you selling through distributors? Is your reputation carrying the primary value here? And so then brand carries the weight. If I talk about having lunch at the Golden Arches, you know where I went, and you can probably even smell the French fries right now. The branding does carry weight. So some take homes uh, as my final slide here. Uh, an invention is not a product. When you come up with technology, it's great. I love it, I've spent my entire career in it. But it isn't at the form where somebody can use it to solve their problem just yet. Maybe it needs regulatory approval. Maybe it needs a convenient interface. Maybe it needs additional third-party information. There's thousands of units of intellectual property in a cell phone and no one of them is gonna work alone. So you take those many, many thousands of inventions and they have to be combined to make a product. Don't DIY this. Uh, patents, trademarks, copyrights, these are all different areas of expertise and different legal focuses. Um, patent, a patent lawyer who specializes in patent litigation will know something about other areas of IP, but it's not their specialist and vice versa. Get the expertise you need and get guidance on how to get it. And this starts with understanding what your path and your strategy looks like. There's accounting and tax considerations in here too. Uh, if you are doing R&D, Shred is a resource you're, that, that's available and you really do want to look into it. This is money. Everybody could use a little bit more of it. Um, and this is a great thing in Canada. The Shred program is unique and just a fantastic way to help companies stretch farther. And plan ahead. Your various IP instruments have a lot of fixed deadlines. You can plan these budgets. When you file a patent today, there, there's a fixed timeline of when things will roll out and when expenses will start to occur. You're not going to know to the exact day necessarily, but you're going to know within a month or two when it should be, and you can plan for these. You don't wanna get caught out and you don't wanna rush into decisions. And with that, I will say thank you and hand things over to Beatrice. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Cynthia, for, uh, for the practical advice and the considerations to think about on how to use your IP strategically. I love the expression, uh, 
random acts of IP. Let's let's not do that. <laughs> so uh, yes, I will pass the floor on to Dr. Beatrice Negacha, who will uh, speak about the importance of IP searching. Beatrice. Thank you, Nina. Yes. Okay. So when you are in business, there are always, uh, when it comes to IP, intellectual property, there are always two main type of concerns. Uh, the first one being, is my IP adequately protected? And the second one being, am I infringing on someone else's IP? So these mainly are the two concern that IP people, uh, business owner dealing with IP would be concerned of. Both these concerns revolve around searching. So for the IP, I am generating my own IP, IP. I want to know what's already out there that's close or that is relevant to my IP. This will give me an idea of what am I, what I am entitled to protect. What, I'm, what space I'm able to claim as mine, okay? So that's regarding my own IP. And then for the other people's IP, I want to be aware of them so that I can plan my business strategy accordingly, okay? And um, I would say IP search is a very important topic. Uh, we cannot really do it justice by the time allocated for this presentation, but the idea here is really to give you an, an idea to show how you can use searches in IP to, as a tool to manage your business. Also, we would like to convey the idea that while it is strongly recommended that uh, you conduct your own IP searches uh, as a first step, it is only also strongly recommended that you consult with you, you seek the help of an IP professional, okay? So we will see later in the presentation how, how this plays out. And so it's strongly recommended to seek the help of an IP professional and get a professional opinion on the search results. For this presentation, we will focus on trademark searches and pattern searches. Okay. And uh, to start off, I will start with an anecdote. This anecdote is in the field of pattern. In, no, in the field of trademark, sorry. So with this really anecdote shows how searches can be tricky. And sometimes even missing a word, only a single word can result in a huge financial loss down the road. And um, so back in 2015, the government of Yukon launched an advertising campaign to promote the tourism in the region. And the campaign used the slogan, we'll leave a light on for you. Of course, reference was made here to what's being made here to the Northern Lights. So, and shortly after the campaign was launched, people started pointing out a similarity with uh, a slogan that uh, a motel chain was using. And that slogan was, we'll leave the light on for you. And as it turned out, that motel chain actually owned a registered trademark on we'll leave the light on for you. The government of Yukon had actually, they had made searches before starting using the slogan, the slogan. Okay, but they had searches, searches were conducted on we'll leave a light on and also on we'll leave a light on for you. And uh, really, they didn't find any conflicting results. So even marks that differ by, by as little as a single word, or marks that will that which are spelled differently, but which are otherwise identical in meaning or when sounded, will not necessarily be captured by a search such a search. In this case, as you can see, the difference was merely in the a and the. So of course, the government of Yukon had to change all their materials, their, their materials for their campaign, and a new slogan was created, which was, we leave a light on, and then on the new slogan they finally settled on was, come on, come to my Yukon, we leave, we light the way. Come to my Yukon, we light the way. 
One cannot only not imagine the consequences for a business. The business owner would need to turn around quite quickly and plan a completely new business strategy with potentially a lot of stress and financial loss. And uh, so a trademark professional is skilled and will help you have, will help you avoid such situations. So as in trademark, there are mainly two types of searches. Okay. Uh, the first one is to search the the trademark, um, the, 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 the online database of but database of registered trademarks, such as the Canadian Trademark Office online database. This search will identify trademark registration, pending trademark application, and official marks that are potentially confusing with your mark. And then the second type is the so-called common law search. So since as you are probably aware, in Canada, it is possible to acquire trademark rights simply through the use of your trademark without having to applied to register the mark. So unregistered trademark rights may be out there that, um, that, that will not be identified by a search uh, of the online database, trade, uh, that trademark of those databases. In other words, so a trademark owner may be using their mark without registering it. So that shows that a common law type search is very important. Such search involve a searching website, domain names, Canadian corporate, corporate and trade name directories, business directories. So they, this type of common law search will help you identify marks that are not registered, that have not been applied for registration. So basically, when it comes to trade, the trademarks, one question that gets asked a lot is, Trademark business owners would always ask, what is the cost to register a trademark? Uh, and we believe that uh, the most pressing question to ask would be normally be, what is the cost to search a mark, a trademark, and manage the risk that are associated with using it? Okay, now let's turn to patterns, okay? There are many types of searches around in the field of pattern. First, uh, let's point to the uh, landscape search. So you embark on a research project. It's very certainly helpful to have a good sense of the space you are navigating in. Is it a field that's crowded with pattern or not? So basically, you try to identify the general st state of the art in the field. You locate so-called white spaces, spaces that are not that not so crowded with patterns, and you may direct set the direction of your research work accordingly. If ultimately you are working in one of those white spaces, you may end up having very important pattern, patterns with broad claims and become a key player in that field, in the sense that other people may later on have pattern, obtain patterns on ameliorations or other aspects, but they may not be able to commercialize their product without speaking to you first. So this touches on another type of search that we'll talk about later, the freedom to operate search. But before that, let's talk about the patentability search. So your research work is going on, going well, and you believe you have an innovation that can be patented. The first question you should ask yourself is that, what are my chances of actually getting a pattern on that innovation? And the answer to that question, you will have by conducting a patentability search and obtaining a patentability opinion from a patent professional. So a mid-round search, search, a patentability search is that people will conduct a search of, of the online patent databases for example, the one online database of the Canadian Patent Office, and then they will say, oh, I haven't found a pattern on my invention, so my invention is patentable. So let's just say right away that, that it's false. Because for your invention, 
to be patentable. It must, it must one, one of the two conditions, it must be new and, on, and, and non obvious. And um, the documents co considered for this analysis uh, uh, are like basically all every published documents. So which means that means that which means that you will also need to conduct searches in the scientific literature. Everything, every that's published anywhere in the world and in any languages. And having the search analyzed by a professional search is very important. This will help you uh, really decide whether you want, need to want to go to the next step or not. The next step is the actual preparation and filing of a patent application, and this can be very costly. So now the freedom to operate search that we have mentioned, okay? So, uh, and let's say right away, a myth associated to it also is that, so I got a pattern on my, in my product so I can start commercializing. This is false because some aspect of your product may be protected by patents belonging to other people. And you would need to clear that before la launching your product on the market. And uh, the difference with the patentability search is that for this search, freedom to operate search, only patent documents will be considered and also in a given jurisdiction. As we know, patent as jurisdictional, they protect you in a given country. So you would be clear clearing your activities in a given country. And so let's say you have, there's a pattern and uh, the, that's really on your way and you have the potential to be sued for infringement. You can, you can, if you launch your product, you may be sued for infringement. And one option you have to counterclaim when the infringement action would be to launch an invalidity attack on the, on the, that pattern, which brings us to the loaded type of, of search, which is the invalidity search. And um, this type of search, let's just say it's uh, also similar to the patentability justice search. All type of documents are considered, both patent and non-patent documents. And so, so, and uh, it's okay, when you are deciding to launch an attack on the patent of the competitor, well, that would be at the court. There are also stuff, uh, actions that you can take at the patent office. So if you see a patent application of your competitors, because business owner would generally be monitoring the patenting activities of their competitors. If you see a patent application, that's probably, if it gets into patent, it will get on your way. You can conduct a patentability search on that invention and file relevant documents at the patent office. Of course, with an explanation to why a patent shouldn't be issued on that invention. And also if the patent is issued already, you can request competition the patent office and request re-examination of the patent and submit all relevant documents that you have found. And uh, so just to conclude, conduct an online, there are really basic online searches that you can conduct on your own before seeking the help of an IP professional. It's very important to do so, but before meeting with the professional, you may yourself conduct some basic online quick searches. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Uh, yes, so you've really emphasized the importance on understanding the, uh, the landscape around a business as IP to save time and money. And I'm sure, I'm sure the, um, the citizens of the of Yukon involved in the in the slogan wish they had known that before they uh, they set that out. So thank you, thanks so much. Um, you. So finally, uh, I will pass the floor on to Maximilian Yam, who will provide his perspectives on IP valuation versus business value. What's the difference, Matt? Sure. Thank you. Um, Presenters had a lot of great things to say so far, and I think I might be repeating a few of them. But one of the first areas that I'd like to talk about is the importance of business and IP strategy alignment. IP rights really sit above three main components. The business is overall strategy and their IP strategy, as well as the company's IP culture. Business and IP strategy really can't be separate because a misalignment can have huge implications both the business's value and the IP value down the line. Companies need to seriously consider 
where they're going to be selling, manufacturing, and as well as their distribution networks when considering filing for IP rights. It's okay for these to be concentrated in some degree, but over time, there needs to be some variability built in in order to make adjustments as demand in production centers may shift over time. It's also very important for companies to know who their business and IP competitors are, because in many cases, products may compete directly or indirectly on an IP or technical level, as there may be non-aligned usage cases for some intellectual property that may or may not be considered when evaluating strictly business competitors. It's also very important for companies to be investing in the proper infrastructure fully capitalize on the usage of their intellectual property rights. If a company is collecting lots of data, has important clinical trial relationships, or other research relationships, they need to make sure that they have proper protocols and infrastructure in place in order to fully utilize and capitalize on these assets. IP culture really sits at the center between business strategy and IP strategy, and making sure that all employees know that they have a right to play in the filing and protection of IP rights is critical. There needs to be strong protocols in place in order for companies to record and institutionalize their intellectual property rights, because any IP that slips through the cracks is lost value for both the portfolio and the company. One area that we see quite frequently um, at BDC are some limitations that are associated with in-licensed IP. It's not uncommon for companies to get access to a portfolio of patents from a third party, such as a tech transfer office or be spun out of another company. But it's very important to be cognizant of some of the encumbrances that may be embedded in these licenses that can complicate transfer or change in control of the company down the line. Additionally, milestones and royalties that may have been or appeared reasonable at first negotiation may not be the place in actual practice. So it's important to make sure that companies have a good relationship with the licensor. The balance between the right types of IP is very important. In venture capital, there's a term called product market fit, which describes how a product satisfies a strong market demand and is driven by a strong value proposition and a clearly demonstrated economic value. The mode is an addition that discusses how a company can, pr can protect this uh, competitive advantage and extend and protect their market share. Picking the right mode uses a combination of IP rights that can have overlapping and interlocking protection. Not everything needs to be protected with a patent as it is a very time consuming and resource intensive activity. So that activity should be focused. Trade secrets can be very beneficial for companies, especially because they can provide longer lasting protection than patents when used appropriately. A good portfolio uses a combination of all these IP rights in order to increase and drive value. There's a difference between value and valuation. Value is what somebody is willing to pay for an asset, or valuation is the exercise undertaken to try and understand what the source of the value is. This exercise can depend, the context of value can depend quite a bit on the stakeholder and the circumstances. In some cases, a company may be willing to acquire a company or its IP assets for the talent, diversify its product portfolio or operating geography, or they may be interested in using the IP in some other way in order to capitalize on the value, such as licensing. The exercise of valuation provides valuable insights and is only a small part of the overall activity. Yes, you do get a dollar value at the end of the valuation exercise, but it provides you deeper information onto the competitive advantages of the company and how they're protected by the IP moat. There's three main ways that you can go through a valuation exercise. You can look at the cost to of, cost of develop a technology or a similar technology 
and this will provide you insights onto the realistic cost and timeline needed to develop a similar technology to design around a company's portfolio patents. Discounted cash flow evaluation can provide you valuable insights onto the revenue generation or savings potential of the company and its technology. It can also provide you deep insights into the size of the market and who the key competitors are and how big their market share is. And in some cases, how realistic it is for the company to attain any market share in that sector. Finally, you can use comparable transactions, both of patent portfolios or other IP portfolios and companies to try and understand the context of the valuation to help you understand better the current environment and what's happening on the landscape. Value is really not an absolute uh, exercise and can change very quickly as assumptions change in the market. Getting a portfolio valued in order to obtain financing can be a very worthwhile exercise, but it is very expensive in some cases and can be very resource intensive. So the costs and benefits need to be weighed carefully. A lot of the resources presented today, particularly uh, by Nina at uh, CIPO, can be very valuable when used early on in planning an IP strategy and aligning it properly with the business strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Um, so for providing those explanations on value of IP versus the valuation of IP, I know I know that there's a lot of um, confusion there, um, especially if if that's if IP isn't something that you're necessarily um, familiar with. So I also don't think that you could overemphasize the importance of aligning uh, your IP and business strategies. And I, I love the concept of building that IP culture within a company. It's actually um, maybe something that we should talk about in, in, uh, in a future session. So, um, you know, this, this uh, concludes our, um, our second session of IP Talk.